October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It is an international campaign held every year to heighten awareness about the impact of the disease. The period is also used to raise funds for its diagnosis, treatment, and cure. According to the World Health Organization, 2.3 million women were diagnosed with breast cancer in 2020, and 685,000 deaths were recorded. Up to December 31st last year, there were 7.8 million women around the world who were diagnosed with breast cancer in the past five years, making it the world's most prevalent cancer. On this one-on-one, -on -one, we look at the situation in Barbados, how far we've come when it comes to breast cancer, and also speak to two breast cancer survivors. And a very good evening to you. I am Lisa Lord, and my first guest is one of the founding members of the Breast Screening Program of the Barbados Cancer Society, Dr. Elizabeth Ferdinand. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. We know that you're very busy. Thank you very much for having me. Now, the Breast Screening Program was launched in 1999. Tell me a little bit about the work of the program and why it was so important to launch this program. Well, way back in 1999, when many young people were not even born, there was, first of all, a stigma attached to any kind of cancer, but especially breast cancer. Women never talked about it. It was all hush-hush, and people came at very late stages to, to be diagnosed. So Dr. Shirley Hanneman, Jagru, and myself um, spoke about it and said, what can we do to to try and, you know, increase awareness and also to try and get these women diagnosed as early as possible. So we came on board with the um, First Lady at that time, Mrs. Arthur, and also with the Cancer Society and a few women. And we got together and formed a subcommittee of the Barbados Cancer Society. And our first, one of our first things was, of course, an awareness walk, where we had maybe 100 people first walk. And as you know, that has grown and grown and grown. But unfortunately, with this COVID, we have been unable to do our walk last year, and then again this year. And it's really a fallback for us because that's one of our main, or maybe the main mm -hmm. fundraising effort that we put on every year but so we said we needed to start something so that's how it was born tell me about the services that you offer well we started first of all with just a mammogram we got an analog machine in those days of course we had to save get some money first and we had breast examination of course and the whole idea of putting out leaflets, pamphlets, going on air, speaking about it, getting people to understand that it's not a contagious something as far as we know, and to, to get people more comfortable to talk about breast cancer. And that was the beginning. It took us about a year and a half to raise the funds. And I remember um, Mrs. Arthur, um, Dr. Jagra and myself going to England even to one of the shows, the tourist shows, and somebody gave us a trip on a cruise and we were soliciting funds. So we went worldwide trying to get money to start the show, start the program. And so we were fortunate then to be able to buy a machine, but we had nowhere to, to, to pause it. And initially, the Cancer Society was in the, the, ro the road behind the river road behind mm -hmm. the hospital. And we looked at whether we should have a container, whether we could use there, what we could do. And then um, Minister Thompson, Minister Liz Thompson was um, the Ministry of Health at the time, and I was working there. And we had discussions with her, and we were fortunate that the government gave the Cancer Society um, a lease to have the present premises that we have now in Henry's Lane behind the Purity Bakery. But uh, again, we had to renovate. And fortunate for us, many builders, 
I can, they are too numerous to mention, but many builders and contractors came on board and helped us to renovate and to build on the extra area that we would need for the machine. So eventually we opened our doors and we had to do our business plan as usual and we thought we could do so many a year and well we passed that now but mm -hmm. we were hoping to make sure that as many women as possible women from all strata of society so we had to make sure that the cost to them to have a mammogram test would be reasonable and to be as cheap as possible because it comes with a package you're having your breast examination and then you have your mammogram and we made the premises I think as women friendly or user friendly as we possibly could because we women and you know when you're going for any test especially a test for on your breast mm -hmm. you're a nervous wreck you're worrying from from the time before especially if you have a lump oh that's terrible so you you're already tensed up you're stressed out so we tried to make it comfortable enough so that everyone would be able to come and get the the mammogram in a friendly atmosphere our staff was specially chosen and trained to also be more friendly encourage the ladies and put them at ease. So those were the main services that we started with. But through the years, we decided, look, we need to have a mobile unit where we could go out to education and also do some examinations. We explored the possibility of having a mammogram, a mobile mammogram machine. But with our roads, <laughs> as you well know, with our roads, the calibration of the machine would give us trouble. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was ruled out. So all we can do with the mobile bus is to, or the mobile clinic we call it, is to do examinations, teaching. We teach women how to do self-examination of their breasts. And um, we refer them, if they come and we find a lump or we need to be referred, we, we do referral from the clinic either to our um, stationary clinic or to their GP or to their uh, wherever else they want to go, you know. And gradually, what else? Then we, then we, we, we got surgeons on board. We found that we needed um, to have ultrasounds and we appealed to the public again and we got our ultrasound machine and now we can do ultrasounds. And as the years went by, we found that the analog machine was getting a bit out of dated and we had to move on. So we got a, a digital 2D machine and that now is becoming a little out of date and we have moved on. Our latest machine just arrived last month is our 3D mm -hmm. machine. And we'll talk about those, about that in a little while. We, we're saying that breast cancer is one of the leading causes of death in women. Mm -hmm. And that has not changed over the years, really. But what we have found is that in the early days and even up to maybe 10 years ago, the, the people, the women were presenting very late. So there were big lumps like eggs huge lumps, even lumps that had um, burst and fungated. So, you know, they were really presenting very, very late. So the diagnosis um, in those days was really just a palliative thing. After you've diagnosed, there wasn't much that could be done. But gradually, we have improved that to such a state where women are finding lumps as small as little peas and the prognosis is very good. We call it the five-year survival rate. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. I mean, people have survived 20, 25 years now. We have ladies who are here in the island with that amount of years that they've survived. So the early detection, we say, is the best protection. Find it early. Do not be afraid to come forward 
and get your mammogram test. But that's, so, so the thing is that although now we are finding more cases per year, mm -hmm. they are coming at a much earlier stage. And so it can be treated and in some cases even totally cured and compared to what it was in the past. But as I say, it is early detection. We're finding more women and they're younger, yes, but maybe they're younger because we're finding them at an earlier stage. Because five years, you know, five years if you're 40 and you get it, you're found at 40 with a P, far less 45 with a huge egg. You would have spent a number of years, many years in fact, in public health. How has it changed in terms of, I know you said women are coming forward earlier, but you're still getting those women that are scared to come forward. Well, there are women who hide it up. There's no doubt about it. And I think that they're afraid that their family are going to desert them. They're afraid that they're going to die within a short period of time. And most people, let's face it, we're human. We're afraid of death. We shouldn't be, but we are. That, that's human nature. So I think those are the two main things. Um, financially, they might be afraid that they can't afford it, but the government services are there because if we find that a patient is positive and cannot um, afford to go privately, we refer them to the hospital. In fact, some of the same doctors who work well, they volunteer, let me say. Mm -hmm. They volunteer at the breast screening program. They also work at the QEH. So they take the patients over there, you know. So it's not that it, it can't be afford, afraid, afforded. And I think that that one part that I've explained, I think women should dispel that from their thoughts. I mean, in the early days and not so early, I have heard women say to me, I'm afraid to lose my breast because my boyfriend can leave me. You know, I mean, it's a terrible thought to think about it because that's the time when a woman needs her partner the most, you know, because she's got to think about her children and the, and the family and so. So I think people hide it up because they're afraid. But we've come a long, long way, I think. Uh, women would never talk about it before. Now people go out and say, look, I'm a survivor or I had, I had breast cancer, I'm still a survivor. I'm out and about, I've got a prosthesis, I know what to do. And they talk about it. I'm going for chemo, all of this sort of thing. Before, 15 years ago, nobody talked about it. So I'm, I'm appealing to women who are afraid to come forward. You have friends who are, will, will be with you. So much so that we have a, a group called Bosom Buddies who help each other and uh, we refer any patient to them. We help them to form initially, but mm -hmm. it was too much for us to take on. So some other ladies who are also survivors form that group and, and they take new people under their wings and they, they, they help each other, which is what a support group is supposed to do. But we're finding them very helpful, you know. So women should not be afraid to come forward. Younger women are being diagnosed uh, and they're being diagnosed in their 20s. However, if I have no family history, I was not referred to the breast screening program, but I turned up, I made an appointment. And I say, beyond the usual breast exam, I want a mammogram. I'm 25 years old. We always hear it's not recommended under 40. Can I have that mammogram? Well, let me say, first of all, that Yes, mammograms are only for people for roughly 40 and over. But we have another tool, which is the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And we can do ultrasounds, especially of the younger women. Okay? So there's some type of breast examination that can be used that are not necessarily mammograms. Right? Now, our, two, our new 3D machine is a special machine that can that first of all is more precise. It can find the smallest of lumps. It is not as compressive. In other words, it doesn't squeeze your breasts as much as the other machine, I mean, which people say sometimes hurts them. 
but I, I haven't really found that's a little uncomfortable, but not to say that it's anything serious. But so this machine is more precise. Mm -hmm. It is, is less, it's um, less time, it takes less time to be done. It can be used with people who have dense breasts. And it's been found that we in Barbados seem to have more dense breasts. So when something is dense, like a fog, you can understand that it's hard for the mammogram mm -hmm. to pick it up or even the ultrasound. So this, this new machine is good for that. And also a difference in sizes from the smallest to the largest it can deal with. And, and that, let me bring in here about men. Men too can get breast cancer. We've had a couple in our, uh, in our history and they have to have examinations of their breasts as well. So this new machine can do, can do all of that, right? But women should not be afraid. They can have an ultrasound. Let me step back again. Women can begin by examining their breasts, right? They should learn how to examine their breasts, right and left. They should learn how to do it every month. And you should pick a time. Every month. They, sh they should, yes, you should examine your breast every month. Whether it's, begin, you know, younger women have the menstrual cycles, mm -hmm. so they can have it either just after or before or in the middle. They choose a time so that they can remember when to do it. And they, they stand up in front of the mirror and they look and they examine. They can do it in the bath. They can do it lying down. So they need to know how to examine. You can ask your partner to examine your breast. There's nothing wrong with that. And the thing is that by doing that, you get to know your breast. You get to know the contour of it. You get to know the feel of it. You get to know when anything is wrong. Something is different. I feel something a little different. And so you can then go to a professional and get it checked. So the, the main thing with breast examination, in my, my view, is that you get to learn, so you get to know what is normal, and then you get to know if and when something abnormal happens to it. And then you must seek help right away. Do bras play any um, role in putting your breasts under pressure? Well, you know, people talk about the wire, mm -hmm. the wire, um, the wire Where, bras, and, the and you know, mm -hmm. some of you young people like to lift and lift and what have you. I think that if it is irritating, it will cause a problem. Now, it might not cause cancer, it might cause some kind of irritation, which could possibly need. I'm not an expert on that, but I'm saying common sense would tell you. If it is annoying and it's irritating, and if you're keeping it on for long hours, there might be a problem. Get a comfortable brassiere or bra and use that. When you get home, you take it off if you want, you know, relax yourself. So. Now, let me jump to your other hat as co-coordinator of the National COVID-19 Vaccination Program. Are you in a position to say that we are giving um, the vaccines to breast cancer survivors, those in remission or those suffering from breast cancer at this time? Yes, we certainly are. And they are among the people who need to have the vaccine. I have had many, many people call. They go to their doctors. The doctor says, yes, you can go ahead with it. And we give them the vaccine. We have had, I've had personally a few cases that were said to me, look, doctor says, I'm now going through treatment. I must wait a week or two or a month or whatever it is. So the oncologist has told them to wait. And as soon as they finish the, the, the oncology or they can come, they come up and get their vaccine. And, and, the, and going back to when we had only AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. So we've had a variety of people. And it's not only for breast cancer, any cancers, they can come and get their vaccine. Dr. Ferdinand, given that we're operating now in a COVID-19 environment, um, you would have mentioned earlier the big walk that was obviously impacted, but what other activities do you have um, to celebrate this month? Well, first of all, you know, we, we must continue our awareness, okay? So our main trust at this point in time is awareness. And of course, at the same time, we want to get a little support financially as well. So we have some businesses that have come on board they sell pink drinks for this month and they're going to give us a, a part of that we have people selling donuts cupcakes 
and all that. those lovely little drink things that <laughs> sweet things that we like to eat. But we ourselves are selling t-shirts and other things it's like these beautiful socks that I have on here. We are selling those for on a Saturday at Sheraton and also our pins as usual. So we have a few new pins this year, so come on out and and, and have have a look at them and, and support us. Um, we, we're having a twinning with as our usual partners, CIBC, that we usually do the walk with, and they're doing fundraising as well. So there are lots of awareness going on. Our mobile bus is out going to business places yeah. and um, doing a, a service of looking at their employees, examining their employees. And as well, we that's said, the main thing. And as we said, the awareness is definitely there. We've come, we've come a long way. Yes, very much so. Dr. Ferdinand, thank you so much for talking to us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Elizabeth Ferdinand, one of the founding members of the Breast Screening Program of the Barbados Cancer Society. We'll take a break here and when we return, two women tell us about how they fought breast cancer and won. Working in a school environment, lends itself to close contact no matter how careful we try to be. However, in this pandemic, we have implemented public health policies and measures in schools to protect everyone by installing hand sanitization stations, body temperature checks, and properly ventilated classrooms. While we continue to practice proper hygiene, physical distancing, and wearing masks properly by covering nose and mouth, we should still be concerned about the highly transmissible COVID-19 variants like Delta, which spreads rapidly, resulting in severe illness. Vaccines are tested for safety under very strict regulations. Vaccines are safe and they work. This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Technological and Vocational Training, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and the Pan American Health Organization. Working in a school environment lends itself to close contact, no matter how careful we try to be. However, in this pandemic, we have implemented public health policies and measures in schools to protect everyone by installing hand sanitization stations, body temperature checks, and properly ventilated classrooms. While we continue to practice proper hygiene, physical distancing and wearing masks properly by covering nose and mouth, we should still be concerned about the highly transmittable COVID-19 variants like Delta, which spreads rapidly, resulting in severe illness. Vaccines are tested for safety under very strict regulations. Vaccines are safe and they work. This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Technological and Vocational Training, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and the Pan American Health Organization. Welcome back. Now, before the break, I mentioned that two ladies shared their stories about breast cancer survival with us. We first hear from Mavis Smith about what her experience was like. My first experience with breast cancer was when my mom was diagnosed in 2002. And it was a little scared at first because we always hear about um, someone in your family had to have it before, but my mother was the first to have breast cancer. And she had both her breasts removed. She insisted, the cancer was in one, but she insisted to get both removed, so to stop any spread. About eight years after my mother's diagnosis, I myself was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm accustomed to feeling lumps in my breasts from as early as 13 years old. And it's only after I had about three, three lumps before. And that is when I felt the fourth one is when the doctor allowed me to know that I have fibrocystic breasts and saying that I was already in hospital I got the another surgery 
I got the breast the lump removed and it's only after they did the biopsy then that they come and tell me that it was cancerous. I described the lumps by self-examination. I always, always do my own self-examination. Or, as I keep telling my children, play with the girls. They're yours. I was scared at first because I was thinking about my two daughters. My two daughters was teenagers at that time, so they were my main focus. Well, honestly, for me, at first, saying that I am accustomed going to him to get lumps removed, I tell him, well, we can do the same thing. And F is cancerous because of my mother. F is cancerous. Whatever we have to do, do it. And then after the, the biopsy, he said I have to get chemotherapy and radiation. Diagnosis. The diagnosis, it took me, um, well, the, the, the processing it, it was after I accepted it, which it wasn't long. It didn't take long for me to accept it because I knew my mom had it. And they say, well, normally it is skip generations, but I guess it wanted to find me. So after that, it took me six, six months before my first chemotherapy treatment because you have to had to see the doctor the oncologist and do follow-ups and blood tests and whatever before so that they could determine what kind of chemotherapy I can take at that time chemotherapy was rough it was rough I lost all my hair and for someone that had long long tick here to lose it all it was not easy then it was like the different they had no taste nothing they had any taste sometimes this saints can't smell nothing and and when you do smell something sometimes it is too much for you so then you become nauseous and can't eat and then like chemotherapy give your cravings as though you're pregnant so I started to get some weird cravings funny hours at night I get up to eat cucumbers that's the first time I ever ate a cucumber with the skin on and that's how I wanted it so it between cucumbers and apples that's how my chemo went and it was, and then after the cravings and stuff, and I get to understand and eat stuff that I'm supposed to eat and don't eat what I'm not supposed to eat. Like, you're not supposed to have any dairy oils or anything like that. So, basically, you eat bland food. Enough um, ground provisions. Yeah, and vegetables. No grease, no eggs, no nothing. So everything bland, including no sugar for a little time. Radiation, radiation, radiation was a breeze. Just uncomfortable because you cannot get the area wet. So you have to bathe and bathe one side and then make sure that when you go to the other side, it don't get wet at all. So it was just uncomfortable not painful or anything like that but just uncomfortable with the bathing i had it was 12 12 rounds of chemo and that took me about a year a year a year and some because you have to be well to take chemo or should i say you have to be well to take chemo to make you sick <laughs> all right and then the radiation, radiation, the radiation was about six months. Yeah, so all in all, a year and six months. 
from from self examination, I caught the cancer very early. It wasn't at no stage. So dealing with it, my journey with with cancer, it for me it was easy. It probably it wasn't easy on my family, but it was easy on me. And it it put me out of my shell. I can speak to people more now now and I can say I I'm an advocate for cancer. Cancer and health. So people just find me. So I think honestly that my breast cancer is a blessing because it helped me to help people. Other people probably see cancer as a curse, but for me, it was a blessing. My daughters, they tried, they tried to look brave, but in the back of their mind, they was thinking, saying that they lost their grandmother with cancer, then to have their mother have cancer. They were scared, but then they keep reassuring them, no, this cancer is not going to take me nowhere. I can fight this to the end, and I intend to survive. So we will do what we're supposed to do, and we will survive. No stress, no nothing, no bad energy, nothing. And my sisters, up to now my sisters, I have sisters that refuse to go and get a mammogram because they are scared saying that I always searching they know that I always do my own so they said I always searching so because I was searching I found it but I tell them I search I found and I get um, get treatment for it and just anything else cancer take medication and you can live with it. It's not a death sentence. I have been, I am cancer free for 11 years straight. Now that I'm in remission, I get checkups every six months, which consists of mammogram, chest x-ray, abdom abdominal x-rays. First, I would tell any woman out there, it is just go and get your breast check check it yourself if you have a boyfriend get your boyfriend check them check your breasts and if you find a lump or sometimes you will not find a lump you might have a little soreness a little discharge from the nipple whatever you find go and get it tested and if you happen to hear that you're it's cancerous it's not a death sentence there are treatments and we have a whole lot of um, support groups and stuff out there that you can join. Many, many, many women are turning up to the doctors when they, it's like advanced or, or too advanced. Whereas I think they are scared, but prevention is better than cure. So it's better to know and work with it than to not know. Now, Rosalind Griffith's story is slightly different. She made the brave decision to remove both breasts, a decision she said saved her life. Um, my first experience with breast cancer started with my sister. Um, she discovered she had breast cancer in 2010. And this was strange for us because we did not have cancer in our family. So her diagnosis went like cancer. But um, we tackled it together. I was with her when she was diagnosed. I was with her throughout most of her um, treatment, doctor visits, you know, and her final stages, I was with her. So she would have succumbed in 2014, but um, she did everything. She did the chemo, she recovered, and then the cancer came back very aggressive. So she succumbed in 2014. But she was a beautiful spirit in all of this. She never complained, never fret. She was just, you know, so peaceful and loving. Well, I discovered my lump the next year, 2015 actually, and I went to about three doctors. 
before I was actually diagnosed um, because I discovered the lump. I told them about my sister's history. They were like, oh, it's yes. Um, no problem. It's nothing serious. But I was uncomfortable. So I still continued. The third doctor I went to, he did an ultrasound in his office. And he said, there's nothing to worry about. It's, you know, it seems to be good, but I'm going to do further tests. So he did send me for further tests and I went back to Cancer Society because I had previously done a mammogram the year before. So when I went back, um, it was like, I was a frightened, you know, but in my mind, I knew the possibility exists. And I went back and they said, I'll send you the results to your doctor and everything. So that was okay. But then they gave me a call and was like, could you come in right away? So I suspected, you know, and they said, I'm coming. We need you to come in and pay for uh, this. Cause we were, you know, and I was like, why are they calling me in? This sounds very fishy, you know? So I went in and I paid for the, this and everything. And then I got a call right after the doctor saying they want to see me right away. So in my mind, I was like, okay, I can go to the doctor, but I ain't telling nobody because I don't want nobody to accompany me. As I said, my family know was going through this. So just before my daughter didn't ask the evening, but then she remembered, she said, Mommy, what happened? At the, I, I said, I have to go to the doctor. I said, I go in with you. So I couldn't get out of that. So we went back to the doctor. And when I went back to the doctor, he, you know, I guess he was, you know, but then he told me, um, they did discover the lump and they need to do further tests and everything like that. And he was sending me to a surgeon that he would use himself. And he tried to reassure me. And I was referred to the surgeon. The surgeon would have done the biopsy in his office there and then. Um, I was even expecting it, but he did the biopsy in his office there and then. He said he would send it off and go, you know, I went and paid to have it set off and everything like that. So when the results came back, I think you pay either for two weeks or three weeks. I can't remember which one I chose. But when that happened and I went back, he was like, yes, it did come back cancerous. And it is this. I can't remember if he said it was stage two, but eventually I found out it was stage two. And he wanted to do the operation as soon as possible. I remember this was like August 6th. And I was like, no, you can't do this operation right away because my birthday is at the end of this month. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm looking forward to my 50th birthday, you know. And I even told him, no, I'm not sick. So when you do the surgery, you're going to make me sick. So I celebrated my birthday and then I would get sick after. And that's what we did. I said I wanted the surgery. I didn't want no, you know, the lump to remove or anything like that. Because remember, I said my sister went through this. So no. And he was thinking about I will remove one breast. I said no, I'm removing both. And he looked at me like I said, yeah, I'm removing both. I'm going through this again with no breast, and you know, because in my mind. That did not define me. Breasts don't define me or anything like that. And, I, you know, I realized it was a fight and I have to fight for me and I was prepared to fight. My daughter was a medical student. So I guess for her, it was a little too much knowledge and the fear, you know, of everything. But for my family, no. I, throughout this process, I never cried, you know. We didn't cry. It wasn't like, you know. And... I went, we, we had a family meeting, and I, I come from a very big family, so we had a family meeting. And in this process, I had another sister who doesn't live here, but she now discovered she had cancer. So they knew about her. So they probably thought this family meeting was to tell them about her. But during this too, she did the genetic test and it came back that it was in our family and there were three different types of cancer. That's why it was so, you know, amazing about it. And we had the meeting and we told them about her. So then when we said, and there's more. And I remember when we went down there, I went and positioned myself right next to my nephew, who I was really close with. I went to sit right next to him. So when we said that, everybody was like, and tears just started to flow. Because I guess they, they relive my sister experience. And I remember I said, I'm going to be good. And one of my sisters said, that's the same thing that Elian would have said, you know. So the fight was not for me, but it was for this whole family. I had to fight for them. Even for my surgery, I was prepared because at that time I recognized that life was not mine. So I wasn't even afraid of for my surgery because at that time I was like, Lord, this is about you. This is, I have to give you everything. Even when I lay on that surgery bed before they wheeled me in, I was like, I closed my eyes and said, God, it's up to you now. 
you know, I did my prayer. If you could take me, I want to make sure I go with you, you know. But what it is too, Joe, the whole process that I was telling God, I said, well, if this is a test you're putting me through, I don't feel this. So I prepare to fight this test, you know. And that is how I went into it. I went into it. It was a fight. I fight in. The surgery was really good, to be honest. Um, you know, it was... I didn't even, well, obviously I don't know, but I come out and the, the others was there. My sisters came, my friends came. I had a really good support system. And my friends came and everything like that. And the recovery process was not bad, to be honest with you, because I did nothing. My friends made sure I did nothing. I didn't cook. I didn't even walk with a bag. If I had a bag, I remember my sister going, holy, I did absolutely nothing. My family took care of me throughout that whole process. So I was able to heal and recover. So after the surgery and I would have healed, um, you know, the doctor would have been monitoring this healing process. I think I started my chemo around November, like the end of November. Remember my surgery was like the 9th of September or something like that. And I started my chemo. And I went through the process, I was private, um, I did private. And the chemo, I, uh, um, to be honest, I didn't like it, but I figured, you know, I'm going to do this. And I was prepared, I know that you lost your hair. I went and I cut off all my hair. I used to keep my hair really low, so cutting it off was not a big deal. I always used to keep it low. So I went and I cut my hair in preparation. I went to the sh I did. I mean, I did all sorts of things. I shot my goods. I went and prepared like, for this thing that because I ain't coming back out unless I needed to. But the chemo process was not bad. I didn't like the sensation of, you know, the strange sensation that was going through your body. I really don't like that because, as I said, this is a foreign subject. This wasn't made to be in my body. So sitting down there and watching this going through your body, I don't like that, to be honest. I don't like that. But I, and being that my daughter was studying, my friends just said, no, she will not have to deal with anything. So they took everything off of her. They took me to the doctor. They took me to my assignments. They came, they cook. So, you know, that is how my process was. I would not like, I hardly was, um, sick in terms of like um, vomiting or anything like that but I did have a reaction where I had itching so my hands and feet would itch like crazy my hands and feet would itch so much that the only thing that would help would be icing I used to numb them and I would numb it I would keep my foot I was sitting down with my foot in ice I was sitting down my hands in ice so I would numb it I would have like a heat in my body. I remember one night getting up and taking off my hand, my clothes and just going in the bath. You know, that was my thing. The strange sensation in your hands and your feet up to this day, you still have that. I could not button shirts and I could not like put um, an earring back on or even buckle a shoe. Those were things I had to rely on my daughter to do because sometimes it takes so long they're trying to button the shirt, you know. And the simple things that you recognize that you were not able to do. I had um, eight rounds of chemo and I think I did them in two weeks. In two weeks phases. You can either do them in two or three weeks. Mine was in two weeks. I never had to stop. Um, thank God for that. Because sometimes people have to stop and they have to go over. But I never had to stop because um, my, my blood count was not low i think it was once but it went like that was the mother we did it the friday so i never missed my regime in terms of that and it was pretty you know it was over i was conking now actually and i tell people it's crazy you know because throughout my chemo process i was enjoying the weight loss <laughs> and i used to really be enjoying but i was monitoring it because i was saying it shall not go beyond a certain level but i used to enjoy the fact that when i go to the daughter telling me i'm losing weight and that might be crazy, but that's what I was enjoying. And um, soon after we would have started, I think they let you heal again. And then, you know, they prepare you for the radiation process. So you go, you do the, you go to the radiation, you get your markings and everything like that. And you do the radiation. That process was not bad for me. I heard you get burned. People say you get burned, blah, blah, blah. But um, people say do aloes. I did nothing like that. The doctor just said, don't bathe it, and I did not bathe it. I did not touch it because I don't want to go and bathe and get one of these burns. I would put administer powder. He had said, just put powder, and I would administer the powder. But 
on that radiation table and that came all going through me. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I relied on God. I don't know if that radiation table ever gets so much prayer, but I pray on that and I just, you know, went through it with faith and yeah, but they felt they were really nice. Those were helped too with the process because you do the radiation at the hospital. And I remember one time coming out, I couldn't even get my shirt buttoned and the the gentleman, he realized and he came and he do it for me, you know, but I had prepared to just do a pin and run to my car, you know, but the process was not bad for me. That process was not bad for me, to be honest with you. And then again, because I had my support system and in this, I never felt like I was sick, you know, I never felt like I was sick. Like, I hope people will say they react to the hair loss. Nothing like that didn't like, make me cry or anything like that. Actually, only one day when I was walking and I see myself in the mirror, I tap back. And I'm like, wait, I got my hair. And I start to laugh, you know, with myself. But during the process, I recognized I needed to heal. I kept away from people. I kept away from negative people because as I said, my sister had no day. People didn't automatically kill me and I was not dealing with them, you know. So I kept away from people. I know that sometimes when you go there, you mix with people, they could bring your, you know, they do you more harm. So I kept away. I did the online church. Our church was coming online. And during that process, it was like, I was really, I was, on, me and God had a connection and we really did and even like I got up in the night, I remember one night I got up morning and I said, morning, and I started to sing. I said, no, I got to turn this morning into my songs. And I sat in my bed that night and I just started to sing and praise God and think, but we really had a connection because I used to say, God had blessed me in this mess. And I saw that through my process. I would be honest with you, I am an advocate for removing your breasts. I will tell them remove the breasts because coming out of this, I, um, we form a support group. So, you know, in this support group, I deal with all types of ladies from, we had a 20 year old, we deal with all types. And, you know, I've seen ladies, the cancer gone to the other breast. You know, they have to go through that again. And my advice would be remove the breast. It does not define you as a person. And one of the things I said, um, I might be bruised, I might be battered, but I'm not broken, you know. So I would advise ladies to remove your breasts. You know, it doesn't, and don't allow people to define who you are. You know, they can't tell your story. You're the only body that can tell your story. They can think they know your story, but they don't know your story. So don't allow it. I had a lady that she was like, oh, we're getting fat. People say, I said, don't worry about people. They don't know your story, you know. They might see you going on. They don't know the reason you're getting fat. They don't know anything about you. So do you. That's my advice. Do you and don't allow nobody to define you. Victorious Warriors is my sister group. That was not our original name. We wanted to name Sister Sister. And it's a group of ladies. It's about 30 ladies right now. Um, they've almost been diagnosed with some form of cancer. It's not only breast cancer. We have various cancers. Um, we range in all ages. And we come together to support and encourage each other. So we were in another organization and, you know, we just think, we, I said I was leaving and most of the said, okay, we're going to come with you. And we form our group. And in that group, we, as I said, we do all sorts of things. We do breakfast. We do, we wanted to do a retreat, but COVID kind of closed us down. We went on a cruise. We, um... We have parties, we have fun days, we have, but you know, we do church services. We wanted to do a lot more this year, but again, COVID. And I, the last I said to them, you know what, we can go and get our tests and still do, you know, come out and have fun. Because my thing is, these ladies need that support. And I encourage them to forget about the family. Don't concentrate on the family, forget the husband, forget the children, forget whoever is about you. This is our session now where we can concentrate on ourselves, we can have fun, we can do things. You can come in, we have a chat, you come in the chat and you can talk and say, hey ladies, I'm experiencing X, Y, and Z. Then someone in the group might be able to say, oh, this is what I've done, this is what I went through, you can use this. So is that support group, is that shoulder to lean on? that buddy you need, that sister you need. Um, 
in our group last year when we had we normally we had um Bishop, it was december our party and i recognized that some of the ladies were had lost their jobs and we normally would do a gift exchange and it just come to me i said no we don't need a gift exchange i said ladies let's do hampers and the response was really good and coming up with that we had four hampers but we have support outside of our group we have our friends or families that you know they're willing to support us and we did actually five hampers and we were able to bless those ladies with five hampers so we do things like that we have someone going through chemo and we knew that she would not be able to cook we take uh, we alternate and we cook and we cook that for her if someone in the group said they're going through um a challenge we do collections among ourselves and we bless that person with that um and we do it sometimes we do it anonymous because i don't want to expose people you know persons are at their worst sometimes to just say they need so i want them to be comfortable i don't want you don't have to tell me sometimes they say tell somebody else and they could come and tell me but i think i've developed the trust within the ladies you know and I don't go there and I say X or Y, I just do it. I say, one of our sisters have a problem, let us help. And the response is good. So we help ourselves like that. And then we decide, you know, the best thing to do, the Lord was laying on our mind, on my mind. Why not go there and register as a charity? Get out there and do more, you know. You need the financial support. There's only that amount you can do or, you know. So we went and we registered our charity. So we are officially a charity. I've been cancer free if I was diagnosed in 2015, I think about 2016, they would have done the test, you know. And at the beginning, I think you did check us like every three months, then they go to six months, then they go, you know. But my tests have been good. I think I'm on a six month regime. But um, they would do their tests, they would do their checks, they would do, um, I did, they, sometimes they send you for the ultrasound, they check your heart, you know, various things that they would do. But one of the things I find that the hospital had never done for me was a CAT scan or, you know, and I wanted that. Because I had answered, they say, oh, you're good. But I wanted my mind to know that I was good. So I went private and get a doctor schedule me the CAT scan and the bone scan. I wanted a bone scan too, because those were tests you would have done before, you know. So I wanted those to so my mind could be settled because although i would tell you i am comfortable every time you have to go to that appointment a little bit of fear comes in you're like i hope my blood work is good you know so you get that fear and then i find for persons that went through cancer everything we blame on the cancer so if you get a fingernail hurt you're gonna be like making sure it ain't cancerous you know but then you go like talk to yourself and say you know what they ain't cancer or something like that but that's how it goes the checkups in barbies i find they're good if you have a lump and you are frightened i think you get a support don't go by yourself because the doctor's telling you you're minding listening you don't even know what he's telling you for some people so i encourage you to go with a family member or a friend and that's what we do we said in our group we are there for you if you want to go to your daughter you're frightened call one of us we'll go with you we'll walk that walk with you so I said to people, get somebody to go with you. But to ladies, I always tell my group, there's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about anybody in our group. And if we have done it, we have been, you can do it too. So just look at us, see what we look like, and know that you can win this battle. So after hearing from a medical expert and two ladies who survived breast cancer, one thing stands out. Early detection is still the best protection. I am Lisa Lord, and this was One on One. Do have a wonderful evening.